Okay, welcome everyone to this. Uh, I think this is the last session before we, we do a, a summer break of as a Kanban trainer um, with, the, with the Pro Kanban community. Um, and we have the privilege like, um, of having Dave Skinner joining us today. And, and thank you, Jay, Dave, for joining us kind of like relatively last minute. Um, um, so it's, it's, we were going to have you as the first one after the summer, but you know, we, we moved it forward and we have a summer here, at least in the UK, it's yeah. very, very hot at the moment. So we are, we're kind of melting here. Um, but as I was saying, Dave, um, Skinner is just like one, one of the first Kanban, uh, Kanban trainers with, with Pro Kanban, lots of experience, lots of experience outside of what we would normally call the traditional IT environments as well. So it's absolute privilege and honor to have Dave here. So say hi to Dave and at the same time, like anything you'd like to say at all, Dave? Hey everyone. Just hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Direct and to the point. Yeah. Um, so um, it, as you saw with, with us at Kanban training sessions, um, you can ask any questions that you want. Dave, difficult questions, um, he answers. Easy questions, I might help. Um, but please, um, in chat or um, uh, in chat, ask the questions. We will try to pick them up and invite invite people to contribute. So it's not just going to be Dave or myself speaking for an hour. Um, so please participate with your own opinions, your own thoughts, your own experience, um, and things like that. Um, as we give you a few minutes to to write questions. Perhaps what we need to do is um, have a conversation with Dave and, and, and cover the, you know, what's what's the, you know, you're, you're doing Kanban in what we would call non, what we normally would say non-traditional environments, as that means usually yeah. non-IT, yeah? Yeah. So what's the, what's your experience of using Kanban in like oil rigs and things like that? Um, it's interesting. It's been interesting. And um, what I would say is Kanban, Kanban systems are, are Kanban systems, really. If you think about it from a software point of view, there's a very um, kind of traditional flow of value that you can get within any kind of complex environment or software system where you've got. And my background is a software engineer. So, you know, many years ago, I'm de-skilled now, but, but I was a software engineer. And um, so you can understand, okay, this is how work goes from conversation with your customer to delivering your product. Very, very much the same um, in the non-software environment. You have something um, an idea, a stratagem, a, a, a some kind of conceptual thing that needs to be delivered to give value to that company. Um, and it's just a case of working out and flowing that value to a point of done. Now, what ends up being difficult is people figuring out, okay, here's where my team is. How does that fit into the overall organization and structure? How does value flow from team to team to team to actually ultimately get done and become something which is, you know, at the pretzel station or the forecourt or or whatever it is, um, you know, mapping that out becomes an interesting challenge. But at the same time, it is still a workflow that we can define. There are very much commitment points and start points where you pull work forward um, and deliver it to done. There's loads and loads of commonalities and it, it works really, really well um, outside of software. It's, it's knowledge work, it's, um, you know, it, it's a good fit, I would say. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of like similarities in terms of like there is complexity and discovery and all yeah. these dependencies and his knowledge work. What what would be different? I mean, when I'm thinking about um, oil exploration or oil industries like that, it, it feels more elements of industrial, but also feels like the cycle times are going to be longer, that there is like key specialism, so you may have more handovers. What are the big yes. differences for you? Uh, dependencies would be the, the big highlight for me. Um, that's that's perhaps different and um, there's significantly more dependencies, lots of waiting queues that you'll find in a Kanban system inside the industry. You'll be lots of things where I'm waiting for that team over there to do something. And that's when you start to build in this cross-functional team so we can actually kind of eliminate those and identify them. That, that'd be the biggest thing um, for me is, is those dependencies and also dependencies outside of your own environment. So dependencies mm -hmm. outside of company you're in because I've got to wait for vendors to do something or I've got to wait for somebody to go offshore to do a survey, for example. Um, I have to wait for that to happen and I can't just do it tomorrow. It needs to be scheduled in. So you've then got that interface between some of the traditional waterfall project planning type activity and mm -hmm. your own 
value stream in terms of how am I getting my stuff done? So those kind of things tend to be the biggest differences, huge dependencies across the board um, and figuring out where teams kind of interact with each other and then being able to make those changes. Um, mm -hmm. that, that would be my, my thoughts there, I would say. Yeah. And, and, and again, go, connecting it back to the, if we go back to the, I mean, what we think about IT world, the dependencies do exist in the IT world. It's how, yeah. do, we, how, how do you handle those in, in your context? Is there any secret magic potion or is like, how, how do you <laughs> I wish, deal with I wish there was. I wish there was. I would probably start my own consultancy if I knew the answer to that particular one. Um, I, for me, it's, it's simple stuff. Um, make it visual. Make it visible, make the dependencies clear. Um, those are the things that work the best. I mean, I even, I, I remember one team, we just we just had stickers. I mean, this is when we actually were able to be in an office and speak to real humans um, back in those days um, where we had whiteboards and sellotape and magnetic cards and things. And um, Stickers to indicate there's a dependency here with that team and doing stuff kind of before the equipment point to kind of figure out what the dependencies might be and it's just making people realize that instead of focusing on dependencies right in the middle of your work in progress and then discovering that you're now blocked look at them further upstream of your commitment point or your start point and go okay what are the dependencies likely to be what does the past tell us are the dependencies and flagging those up and actually using the visual indications that we get in the Kanban system to to make it obvious, make it visible. And then when you're yeah. speaking to stakeholders and stuff, they say, well, what's that? Well, that's us. We have to wait for that thing to happen over there. Or how can I help with that? Well, actually, you could help with that. You could unlock it by having that conversation. That would really give us um, a good heads up. That, that kind of thing, making it visible means that people will kind of more likely to take action. Um, it's really interesting because, I mean, I, I completely agree. It's, um this idea of if what you're saying there like help make helping people think about you know what, what, what dependencies might we might encounter and, and anticipate yeah. where where and how those dependencies can help. One, one thing that we keep talking about many times is um we, we tend to start work because we can um and and instead it would be more useful if we start the work because we believe that we might be able to finish it yeah and that's simple change. It's it, it's that like we started work just because I can, whatever whatever the consequences to other people, and that yeah. flips it into hey, you know, think about what else might be happening if if you were to start the work. So yeah, yeah. that's 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 awesome. That's um, it would be great. I mean, as 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 we're having a bit of a conversation, it would be great if you have any questions. Like you can raise your hands or you can type them in chat, um, so that we we can ask questions to to um, Dave and hey okay, first question just arrived um Frederick would you like to would you like to ask the question with um yourself what is it <laughs> okay Frederick uh, um, yes my question yep. was when you give work to an outside vendor or uh, a different group and you know there's uh, I cannot understand the word. Do you move uh, that uh, activity down to another swim lane or a parking lot or someplace so that it doesn't kill your work in process uh, limits while you're, you know, you have to wait for them to, and hopefully, you know, how long it's going to take or something. But that's always seems like a problem when you've got, especially with vendors. Yeah. Um, sometimes is the honest answer. So sometimes yes, yeah, sometimes no. It really depends on the team, as you know, as any as any good agile coach will say, it depends on the team. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there are there are some dependencies, for example, where the the wait time is going to be weeks. It's not going to be resolved um, in this week or, or 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 today. It's going to be it's going to take eight weeks to get this thing back from. This. And for those ones, yes, they will get parked into a queue. Um, so they're still visible. They're sitting there waiting for something to come back and it's built into the workflow so that we know there's a signal that says, we've now got the information back and we can pull it forward again and to continue the work. Um, there are some where we don't do that, where the dependency exists, but 
we should be able to resolve that dependency by simply having the conversation or escalating or something like that. And that would be either flagged, it's either going to get blocked because we can't get access to the person for some reason and we'll block it and we'll track those blockers so we can actually track you know, what kinds of things are giving us problems, what kinds of things are stopping the workflow so we can see them because it should be resolvable. Um, that's that's essentially the answer there is sometimes we move it to swim lane, sometimes we move it to a workflow column, uh, depending on the team, to the, but keep it visible. Um, the biggest thing is not hiding it away somewhere else. Don't don't put it backwards, you know, the, the kind of the, the big maximum of Kanban, it kind of flows forward. Don't put it somewhere else so that you can't see it anymore. Make sure it's still sitting there, make sure it's visible, make sure the team can see it, they're focusing it. The, the work I am aging is there, it's present, we can see we've been waiting for X amount of weeks. Um, you can sometimes put things like SLEs inside the columns as well we've, we've, we've toyed with. So I can see, here's my queuing column, my SLE in here is eight weeks because that's you know that's what we said. Um, once it's getting towards that eight weeks, now we need to take action again because we should have had that um, dependency resolved by now, that kind of thing. Um, so those are the things you can play with um, to help those metrics as well. If I, if, I add, if I add one thing to what, um, I don't know if my audio is gone completely. No, you, no your audio I is think, gone, I think. Are you back now? Go for it. Yeah, I think my audio has a big delay, so um, I'll, I'll just be quick. Um, the um, the one thing that was interesting what you were saying with like if you, if we know that for example this is going to be something that's going to take eight weeks of delay or and it doesn't understood that has that already implies that we can actively manage that flow rather than just something being um with a dependency um and we don't know what's going to happen or how long or when it, you know we have known you cannot anticipate when it might come back so Dependencies that are not handled or are not understood creates lots of issues. If they are understood, you have the opportunity to create a, an agreement. We, we tend to talk about explicit policies. But explicit policies are good agreements. So we can turn this kind of like potential source of conflict, frustration, delays, blockers, all that into something that is an agreement, collaboration, positive things. And what you can do, for example, is to say, look, you know, then uh, if I know that X external party needs, um, you know, uh, is going to do the work. What you can start thinking is like, okay, how much work can they tolerate coming from us? And you can say, look, you know, don't don't have more than six items being sent to that external party at any time, because if we do that, we are choking them. Yeah, yeah? Um, that allows back to what Dave was saying to say. All right, if you're going to start something else, if it's going to need to go through that third party, maybe maybe we can look and say, oh, that third party already has too much work. Better not put it. Yeah. Better go and do something else. So it's, it's this thing is about active, actively manage, managing flow, which does not necessarily all depend on having weight limits. So does it just having, you know, other, other solutions that can help? And it's very much of an it depends on your context. But yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, and just what I'm finding is just simply visualizing these things is the biggest help to any team, just having it visible. Um, so, for example, if I had that queuing column where I know I've got dependencies and I'm waiting for something, if we suddenly see that queuing column start to build up and build up and build up, that tells the team something. That tells them we've got to resolve this in a different way because we're always dependent upon something else. How do we, how do we restructure? And we've actually had partnering conversations with people like vendors and just going, okay, how can we partner together with you so that we can resolve this impediment that we're seeing in our teams? And those kind of conversations become active and you start to solve. Um, so it's, it's been a really interesting kind of um, example um, that we've been following. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think it's been mentioned, things like paying attention to aging is a very yeah. powerful thing to do. Yeah. Um, to help there. Um, cool, um, there is a, a really, Pretty interesting question from um, Mikey um, about um, teams with people who are not permanent and you know maybe not there all the time. Mikey, would you like to yeah. ask the question? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, hi, Dave. Um, 
I'm keen to know, and I'm assuming that your team is made up of permanent team members and also made up of non-permanent team members like flow to work type people, um, which is not ideal. I mean, we all want the perfect team where everybody's, you know, permanent and they all attend the ceremonies and they all, you know, but how do you deal with it on your side when you don't have that perfect scenario? How do you deal with um, flow to work people who are maybe split over 10 or 12 projects? How do you show that on your CAN board? How do you plan around it? What do you think about it? Have you found like, a, you know, a, a silver bullet to, to resolve this? Um, that is literally the question of the day. Um, that is what we are looking at at this very moment in time to figure out how, how to solve that kind of stuff. What, what I've been talking about, um, more than anything else is um, the flight levels type concepts where you start looking at, okay, our end-to-end -end coordination of Kanban and, and moving away from the kind of team level Kanban, which gives you something. I can, I can manage my team now. I can, I've got pool systems. I've got whip limited, great stuff. What's coming into my team and where's, where's the pool coming from? So we, we're shifting up to the kind of flight level two kind of conversation to say, okay, where are the pools coming from? What, what resources do we have that are, are scarce or specialist, et cetera. Um, and we're starting to play with um, token-based whip limits as well now. So where we, we've got tokens where I've got a limited number of these specialists kind of flow to work people. I've got, I've got five of them, for example. And once they're deployed across five projects, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I've got my whip limit and I can't pull any further. It's things like that to try and figure out um, where my people are um, and just allowing them to figure out, okay, what is your limit? Use, use the kind of conversation with the people who are doing the job rather than being directive at the top level. Use a conversation with the people to figure out, well, what would work for you? How can you support how many projects? What does that look like? Um, wh which events would you have to go to or, or which meetings would you have to go to to go and um, get the right context? Um, so using that conversation to help for them to help us with what would work. Sorry. So um, the fact that your specialists or your flow to work people couldn't attend all the ceremonies, you work around that. You yeah. you, you have conversations. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because for some of the, for some of them, them I mean, in the early days when we were still starting to talk about agility, that was one of the big problems. You were getting conversations with people who were saying, "Well, I've got to go to ten meetings in yeah. a day, across mm -hmm. a bunch, and every day. How do I get any work done?" So it was a conversation to say, well, do you need to be at all those meetings? Which ones do you need to be at today? How can we make it clearer which ones you should go to because your specific context or your specific skills are required there? Bearing in mind, we've got Kanban boards where it's all visible. We know what people are working on. Transparency is there and so on. Um, if we had Scrum teams and Kanban teams and so on. So stuff's visible, stuff's transparent. People are having the right conversations. When you have the right conversations, then you need to attend less of these events is what I'm finding um, because you're, the focus conversations you're having are valuable. And then just having an open conversation around how many things can you actually support? Um, moving away from wanting to be seen to be, I can do 10 things to, well, I can actually only do two. Um, give me a limit of two. There's my work limit. Um, and that's how many things I can, I can support in a given moment in time and use those tokens to kind of shape that demand a little bit. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, Dave, I've, I've got another question, if I can. May I ask another question? Yeah, uh, can, I, can I add, yes, but can I, can I add something to that question as well? Because um, one thing that I was going to say is that um, what, what's very important as well is that not, not everything, the team is not always the right answer for everything that we do. Team, forming teams is fundamentally useful, but there is organizations where um, one example typical that we see, you may have like one UX person and 20 teams. You, that person cannot belong to 20, to 20 different teams. Yeah. So it's much better to start using the concept of services between teams. And that, that person can be the, the, a service provider to those teams. Um, I was talking to a telecoms provider recently and they had like literally in the whole planet, they had four engineers that were specialists in a particular type of like uh, broadband aerial. Um, so they they had to serve hundreds of teams that might be using those. You could you could not possibly put them inside teams. It didn't make any sense. In that in that con in that model, the, the specialist service team 
made more sense that team that put them in, in cross-functional teams. So yeah. you kind of make like a system team, like if it was scaled at well, you do something similar. It, it could be some sort of service providers. One, one thing that I recommend at the moment, I, I found this, this book, Team Topologies, to be really, really useful as well, because it's talking about different models for teams. Um, and it has two, two, two things that I really like. One is the, the, the fact about like, if a team is working on, or someone is working on 12 different projects, that creates a lot of like cognitive load, makes it very, very difficult to people to ever focus. Okay? So how do we reduce cognitive load? You know, there, there are ways of doing it. The other thing that I found super, super useful is when it talks about the connection between teams, to, going back to the dependencies, what kind of conversations could you enable between teams that are working on the same product, between teams which are doing a service to another, which might be a specialist service? The conversations might be slightly different, the interactions might be different. So how to deal with those things is, is mm. it, it has a lot of really good value, this book. Cool? Thank you. Topology. Excellent. Um, would you like, uh, um, uh, sorry, Frederick, is that follow up to this question or shall we, or, or can we go yes. to it? Just one quick, uh, you mentioned uh, you had these four engineers that were specialists uh, and they could obviously be in 20 different teams. Did you put them in a team by themselves and that way you could kind of monitor their services and who went where and what they were working yeah. on? Or that's essentially what we're yeah we're we're experimenting frederick um and but that's the, that's the exact experiment having having their own kind of um board or kanban board which has got a pool system whip limited where i can see the requests for the services coming through using the kind of token whip limits to help shape the demand of where they go to and get them into the right teams um and then actually they're deployed onto cards where we've got valuable work to be doing on the other team's Kanban board so I can see delivery right the way through. So yes is the answer. Um, it's an experiment right now. We're trying to see if it works. Um, I'm feeling confident to be honest, but we need to, we need to play with it. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, Mikey, would you like to ask the second question that you had? Uh, yeah, thank you, Jose. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, Dave, um, it sounds like you, you probably, like a lot of corporates, your team is given um, a lot of uh, projects and deadlines uh, and the stakeholders uh, are not, they're not really interested whether you can finish one, they want everything finished. So how did you have those conversations with stakeholders that all are driving for their project to be completed at the same time? Um, and how did you work that on your Kanban um, framework? You know, how, how did you marry your agile into your problem with stakeholders being so demanding? Yeah, it's it's a similar answer to be honest as the previous one. It's it's what I'm finding is that the the flight levels, and it's is it flight levels? It's really just recognizing that. Kanban applies at all levels. It's not just team. You can apply Kanban at each of the levels of our organization and understand that if we limit WIP um, at the top level, then it becomes clearer what we can and can't deliver. And if we know what those WIP limits are, then the, the kind of transparency of the conversation changes into um, not this hidden thing, no, I can't do it. It's, oh, I can do these things. If you want that pull forward as well, which one of them do you not want? You know, have not as blunt as that, but that's the kind of conversation you end up having. So you can set expectations and use things like cycle time and throughput to help with that predictability. Um, if I can get a predictable system, then I can be a bit more confident with stakeholders. And actually, you'll deliver um, where before, you, if you were juggling 15 different priorities, let's say, you maybe deliver one of those in, in a year's time. Whereas if we start to limit WIP and only ever work on three or four, then you're delivering more, far more frequently. So it's just asking for a bit of trust and then proving that it works and then using things like cycle time and throughput to help that conversation. And and your senior executives, did were they comfortable with that approach? I mean, you know, I think a lot of senior executives talk agile, but they, they don't want to be agile. You know, it's a, um, was it a difficult conversation? Yeah, it's, there's, there's a mix of conversations. Um, it really depends on the person you're speaking to. Um, but yeah, in general, 
we're getting there. I wouldn't say we're complete, but getting there in those conversations um, and just proving it. And that's what we're kind of doing. It's proving this works. Here we go. Here's my Kanban system. Here's my predictable. I'm delivering. The value we got from this team has now been delivered more frequently. Um, and this is why I'm having those conversations. Um, I remember two, three years ago when we, when we were kind of first doing this and just trying to describe a pool system and how that works, that was that was the hard part. Yeah, and, and just making it obvious what a pool system looks like. Um, as a trainer, the, the, the one thing I used the most in that conversation, just out of interest, was the um, the name game. Have you used that one? There's a name game where you write your name in the post-its. Um, so you, you get a bunch of, you get one person to, to have a pen and a, and, a, and, a, and a, you know, he's got a pen. Make that person the leader. So the team leader, the VP, whatever it is, that person's got the pen. Five people. Um, and on round one, push the post-its to the team leader and say you need to write the people's names on the post-its um, and you made the names complicated. It wasn't their name. You had to use a complicated name. So you had to ask how it was spelled and you would ask the, the people doing the pushing to make it really difficult and shout over each other. And, and so it would just take forever to get the, you know, each ticket back with their name on it. And then you change it to pool system and said, right, VP, when, you, when you've got the time, you pull one ticket forward, write the name and give it back. And that's just delivering value. And that was quite a powerful kind of just a really simple game to kind of show how a pool system works um, okay. that helped just simple okay. simple examples like that i think tend to help oh, i like that thank you it's many times uh, that what, what's interesting when when we're working with um with with senior people is that and, and this happens to many organizations is that although with all the best intent a lot of us are very disconnected from one another so if you're working at a more strategic portfolio level, what what your what the decisions at that level, what impact they create down into the delivery level, it's it's not visible, and many times the feedback loop doesn't explain why things work or don't work, and equally you are in in a team delivering work, and you what we all experience is this tsunami of work coming at us. And many times it's like we don't even know why we're near, we're doing this. We just know suddenly that we're working on twelve projects. But why are we working on those projects? And which one actually really matters of those twelve projects? So, so the challenge for most organizations is to, how do we connect all this together? How do we make sense? Um, the time that you're working with, you know, was working with with a with a company that which are based in the UK and the US. You know, so it's it's kind of like relatively big. And suddenly they, they had hundreds of initiatives in the, on the go for, for not that many um, scrum teams, Kanban teams. Yeah? Uh, the ratio of projects per team was about five. But without going to what they were saying, without visualizing that, without visualizing what that portfolio layer was looking and saying like, look, you know, this is the problem. You've got hundreds of initiatives on the go. And all you're doing is just basically interrupting each other and shouting at each other at this level, creating lots of cognitive load, lack of focus, interrupt everywhere else. And no wonder that then you're saying, hey, we cannot deliver anything else. So if if management and you know managing flow and managing work in progress at the higher level you can in the organization, the the impact is enormous on the organization. Going back with what they were saying, you, you can do less things at the same time and actually deliver a lot faster. Yeah. So it's, but it's the conversation kind of, sometimes is like almost like you have to role model it and show the, show yeah. the data and the charts and so on so that people can believe. People will start being curious and say, how come, how come things have been done differently here? And, and you can go and say, like, yeah. look, this is why. This is what we are doing. And we actually saw in the early days, we saw teams implementing Kanban and the team along from them, you know, the next the next bunch of guys were looking over going, how come they're getting things done? <laughs> what are they doing? What's the secret sauce for the, what they're doing? And it was simply implementing Kanban and, you know, that, that started to uh, let things grow. Um, yeah. And you can implement Kanban at any level. I think that's the, the big realization um, for big companies is it's not just a team game. It's looking at the exact same principles um, at the higher level. You just have longer cycle times. 
and that's yeah. that's the main difference with aging and cycle times is bigger because you're looking at bigger chunks of things but you can still age things out if it should have been delivered in six months and it's taking eight months there's the conversation to have you know and um, just takes a longer time to kind of um, get that realization is it still is it still flow by its glacial flow Gla yeah. glaciers is flow but just very very slowly yeah. Yes. Um, there yeah. are two questions that are actually quite connected and, and follow up on this. Um, let's start with uh, um, Martin. Would you like to ask your question about age and aging? Are you good to ask your question? Martin the Young? Oh, he's, he's got a noisy. Um, I, 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 no worries. Yeah, let's read it out for people that are in the recording. Yeah, uh, he had a question like to get a sense of time box. No, no, no. Just to get a sense of the time box your your particular industry works with, what is still an acceptable work item age for you? Which might be one of the difference between you know, yeah IT and, yeah. and um really, really, really depends on the team. Um so there are some teams where um work item age you, you are looking at days um and it's it's quite a fast flow, things are getting done quite quickly, we're pulling things through on some of those teams. Other teams where you know, we're thinking about higher level stuff or delivering a well, for example, um, delivering a turnaround, those things are, are you know, in the, in the realms of two years of cycle time from the kind of conceptualize, we could drill a well here to delivering it and it's online, you're looking at a two year kind of um, cycle time. So that's the kind of different different levels of conversation you can have, but again, it's the same thing as earlier. It's just making it visible and actually recognizing this is what the SLE is. This is how long it should be in here, um, generally speaking. That let, then still lets you have the right conversation, still lets you see what the impediments are and what's blocking the team, um, still lets you see where my SLE is going to be at risk. You know, I can see where those things are. Um, so regardless of how, if it's, if it's two or three days or two or three years, um, you can still you can still visualize that and manage it. Still come back and still has work item types, so it still has yeah. workflow and policies and yeah. actively manage flow, all those all, all the things, metrics, all the things that make come back. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, and you can still have really great conversations around um can we can we deliver you know smaller chunks of this and still get value? So, you know, these yeah. big things take a year to flow through and this, what else happens that we're delivering value in this? Can we visualize that and start to think about how we can visualize value at a lower and lower level, but still focusing on value and the risk of, you know, going too far and just visualizing tasks and to-do lists. And that's where things don't work. And I'm, I've yeah. done, I've gone to that meeting, great stuff, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> it's, I've delivered this piece of value. That's, that's the bit you want to um, keep the focus on. There is a, um, a question that is, um, can we clarify? I'm mean, actually not, um, Cyprian, I know you um, had a question about like limiting WIP and yes, you wanna ask? Hi, hi. So yeah, I'm, I'm working with Kanban teams. I'm trying to, you know, to, to help them get to the next stage in their Kanban game, let's put it like that. So, and I have this question that kind of like, uh, it's like limiting WIP versus uh, actively managing WIP. So I, I don't want to answer myself to the first to the question, but basically yeah, the first one creates the pool system. The second one, you know, it's kind of like it helps you put this pool system into practice. But yeah, regarding the second one, I kind of struggle sometimes to explain the benefits of it or to kind of like to explain how that goes. Maybe you can help me a bit with that, with some examples maybe, or yeah. It's a good question. Um, and it has lots of answers. <laughs> So we'll see what me and Jose come up with. Um, so limiting WIP, limiting WIP tends to be um, an example or not an example. The way I always describe it is um, come up with a number. So teams, especially engineering teams that I'm working with, they'll always try and engineer a number. Well, I've got five people in my team um, and we can, I think we can do 50% um, of our time in this, therefore our WIP limit must be 10. And I kind of go, well, it's no, it might be, it might not be. Um, pick a number that you think is the right number for uh, limiting WIP in that particular column or swim lane or sail or board or whatever it is. Um, and getting people to kind of not engineer it too much. 
and then the actively managing whip is is really just looking at that and is it working um are we you know are we becoming predictable look at my cycle time scatter plots am i becoming predictable in how i deliver um what's happening with whip aging because if i've got a limit of 10 I'm delivering five things all the time, but five things are just sitting aging and I'm not even noticing. I'm not actively managing WIP anymore. I'm just letting five things flow through all the time and I'm leaving behind stuff, which is annoying some customer somewhere. Somebody's not happy with it. And I'm not looking at it, I'm not paying attention to aging. I'm not paying attention to how predictable um, the system becomes. I'm not looking at cumulative flow, for example. I'm not looking at um, the throughput. That's, that's where actively managing WIP comes in. And I've seen teams do that. I've seen teams where they've got a WIP limit of some kind. And yes, stuff is flowing through, but because they're not actively managing WIP, predictability was getting worse. Um, cycle times were actually reducing, um, sorry, increasing. Um, they were getting you know, worse, cycle times were getting worse. And, you know, and, and then you started to say, well, we need to increase our WIP um, because we're not getting things done. and get their own conversations happening. Um, so actively managing WIP is probably the most important part. And that's what really creates that pool system because you're pulling through the right work at the right time. I don't know if that helps or not, but that's how I would Thank you, so it. it helps. So at the end, it's about predictability. And this is something that we should go, yeah. go back to, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I actually, a good command system is an element of predictability, effectiveness, and efficiency. But, but it's one of the components that make a good Kanban system. Yeah. Um, I was going to add that whip, limiting whip or whip limits, it's a technique that we use in order to actively manage um, work or active, actively manage flow. So as a technique, it might be whip limit, could be column based whip limits, it could be system based whip limits, it could be per person whip limits, it would be um, it could be um, swim lane based whip limits for distribution of work. All those are different techniques that would that can help teams actively manage flow, actively manage work. Yeah, um, but it's not a. Comp um, this is where, for example, um, there is a, a difference of opinion between what Kanban method of, of, of um, and Pro Kanban, for example. In some places, we say whip limits are a must have is part of like the standard with the Kanban guide the pro Kanban uses is it's not making that a compulsory thing because sometimes you can actively manage flow by a simple conversation and it's that many times in, in, in when we're working with teams it's not a universal with limits are not a universal answer it's not it's not like you must do it or you're not doing Kanban it's a very very popular and common a very good technique, but it's not always universal. Um, I've seen teams where the conversations was about what what they were saying, uh, saying what might be get on the what might be getting on the way, and if we don't pull work, co conservation of flow. If we if we don't pull work, we're going to end up with no work here. So we might actually need to pull work now. Um, if you know, if we are going to do X, X might happen, or if we pull this one, there might be this dependency kicking in those conversations whip limits don't and don't, don't might help us to generate the conversation but is this active management of flow active anticipating um and managing flow issues and flow opportunities yeah. yeah um that's what needs to happen and and you know whip limits are a great enabler of those because it constrains how much work we have it focuses us yeah. But okay, they're have... not they're not the only technique that we need to use. We can we can do other. Thank thank you for the answers. I have a short, very short follow-up question. I don't want to get to academically, but you know, there is the pro Kanban guide mm -hmm. that is, is there, and there is Scrum with Kanban guide. And in the Scrum with Kanban guide, there is at the actually at the practices, you know, more or less like the definition of it, you have limiting whip. And mm -hmm. on the pro Kanban guide, you don't have that. Is there yes. any reason for that? Is there something behind it? Or yeah. Um, I, I think it's a matter of like the two years span between the two being produced, I will say. Okay. Perhaps. Um, um but look at the in the in the uh, Kanban guide for Scrum teams, the it's talking about limiting whip. Not whip limits. Yes. Well, limiting yes, yes. whip, yeah. And I think that we have evolved that. The word limiting 
Does he use actively managing flow in, in the Kanban guide for strong teams? I don't remember now if the actual word is there. Active um, management of work items in progress. Is there, okay. And yeah. the things that both of them are really similar from that context, from the context of like what needs to happen. One of the way of actively managing work, the work, the progress of work is through limiting whip and the techniques of whip limits. So it's kind of like duplicated to some extent. It's, it's, it's a, a limiting whip is a subcomponent of actively managing flow. So it's kind of okay. like if you think that those are duplications, you don't need to put it twice. Yeah. Um, that's how I that's how I understand it. And I think through the conversations with Daniel Vacante in particular, what what what, what he he. I'm maybe putting too many words in his mouth, but I think that's what he said. <laughs> so, um, uh, it's it's just that it's just that over time um, when when the the Kanban guide came, it's even by removing also the Scrum context here. Um, there was a real look, the Kanban guide. It's such to me what I love about is there's such an elegant synthesis of where Kanban is. Um, so they did a great job about saying what's not needed, what, what is not absolutely necessary. You don't always have to limit with. Even the word limit is quite negative. In our world of like, you're limiting me? Come on, I want to give more. <laughs> yeah, that, that word, it's, 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 it's not ideal. So I think it was in terms of like simplifying and making more, more, synth more synth synth synthesis, it was, it was a, a choice there. I don't know, Dave, if you have any, any thoughts on that. No, I, no, no real um, odds there, I, I, I think. Um, I mean, for me, um, Scrum has an, an, an intrinsic limit anyway. If I do sprint planning, I have a limit. The team knows what the limit of work that they can produce in a single sprint is. It's inherent, it's there. Um, and, and Scrum with Kanban is just um, taking that a little bit further, really, I'm talking about flow. Um, the other thing I wanted to add was um, I, I find it really fascinating and interesting where you can apply whip limits now. Um, so teams, as teams grow and evolve, and they start with, you know, you'll see this yourself. I've got a whip limit on this column, yeah, great cool. stuff, and that column there, and that's a ten, that's a fifteen, and then they start to evolve and think about, okay, but I can limit that swim lane now as well, actually, and maybe this type of work I can only really handle two of those. Um, but I can handle five of this type of work. So you start to get those whip limits in place and then token whip limits as well. So I can only have five of these kinds of things and I can allocate those tokens. Just loads of stuff you can do whip limits and really, really help teams figure out and, and not constrain yourself to this, you know, um, flow of work from one column to the next column, which isn't really how complex systems work. We know that. Um, it's thinking about, well, what is my real flow here? How, how does my work get done? Where are the real limits in place? How can I shape the demand coming into my team? What kinds of work are getting in there? What's the kind of work that gives me the most grief? What's the kind of work that takes away most of the effort from my teams? I can't get this stuff done because they're all doing this and limit those things. Um, just really get into grips and understanding what all that stuff is, is, is fascinating. Um, and when you start to visualize it and teams see it, there's so many light bulb moments come on. You go, oh, really, I get that, oh, okay. And that's why we can't get that done because we're always doing that fantastic stuff you can get thank you that's that's the that's the actively managing workflow in action yeah. mm -hmm. cool excellent any any other questions or any follow-up questions we got about 12 13 minutes to go while you're thinking oh a quick mm -hmm. a quick story where we we first started Good. to implement um kanban and some teams um, and again, it was back in the office. We had whiteboards, cell tape. We could see real humans. It was amazing. Um, and we drew up, we drew up a team's kind of workflow um, on the wall. We had a nice thin cell tape, great stuff. And we got the post-it notes to say, right, go and write up everything that's in progress right now. We filled the wall, and we needed to actually get a bigger wall. Um, just putting up, just that simple visualization of all of the work they were currently the hard in flight at this point in time which is so much it was just that one of those real great kind of light bulb aha moments to go wow no wonder we're, we're struggling to get stuff done here because this is everything we've got on our board 
and this is fresh off some Kanban training as well, you know, so they were starting to think about pool systems and what will minting means. We need to put some limits in place here, guys, don't we? Yes, we do. <laughs> um, but it was it was great fun. It was good. Just reminded me of um, probably the, one of the shortest gigs I ever had. It lasted one morning. Um, and it was it was interesting because it got around what you said. Um, this university and they had all this work i mean actually they, they they started with like you know doing the the weekly project planning meeting and review and they had like seven or eight threes a tiny font and they were going through every line and we said oh, can we can we visualize this and look you know like looking at the background of cyprian you know let's put some post-its on the wall and we had different different size of post-its given the difference of the projects they were like you know small post-its for like anything of less than a month um the sort of like standard rectangular ones for like anything between one and three months um big post-its like little a fives yeah um those were for anything that was more than a year after a while we ran out of the big post-its but it was doing that on the wall when people were you know basically they had all this information on that flat spreadsheet yeah um it was putting on the wall with the, the different size when people went like oh shit that's the problem that we have don't we we just have too much that was it you know so this is just like having that moment of people going, going we knew this but we were not seeing it we we allowed ourselves not to see it that's the power of visualization cool let's talk about tools i think justin do you do is it it's just a question what, what tools i think um mm. do you do do we use the good the bad uh, and the ugly <laughs> yeah there's loads of tools available out there um so mural mural is great um if if we're going to use something to design the workflow murals murals where i would always go first um and it takes away the tools what, what i've what i've been very clear about um, is trying to take the conversation away from tooling and keep it into where Kanban is going to help the team and how that's going to work and how we can design a board um, and whatever method you use to design out what your Kanban system looks like if it's going to be the old static style or if it's going to be just looking at your workflow or looking at what you want the workflow to be or even things like um, VSMs where you actually go through a VSM and figure out where your flow is great whatever you do do a mural and then figure out um, how that's going to help the team. Um, we're looking at other tools. Um, essentially, we're looking at lots of tools across the marketplace right now. Um, I don't think I should probably say too much more than that, to be honest. Um, but looking at things at like the metrics, actual agile, looking at those metrics, looking at scatter plot cycle, then that's the things that are important. Um, it's thinking about how can I visualize web paging? If I can visualize web paging, I can actively manage the work. If I can visualize what my cycle time scatter plots are, that's what I'm looking for in any tool that we use for Kanban. Yeah. And it's interesting because I used to live, I mean, obviously with the time of the pandemic, it's, it's difficult, but we used to say, like, look, you know, um, give me a wall. Physical, yes. physical, physical boards are yeah. ideal. The ideal about those is that they are so customizable and versatile to fit your needs. Yeah. When we start using electric, electronic tools, then you have the constraint of what the tool allows you to do or not. And if the tool doesn't support a particular thing that you need to do, then just as well, you start having to hack it. That's yeah. why, for example, we ended up with this you know, block columns as a pure popular thing. Um, the equivalent in the virtual wall of a physical wall of a of a wall um, is going to be something like the murals, the mirrors, the sort of like whiteboarding tools. Um, yeah. The how the, the key will be then if we can extract data out of it. So when when yes. it got started, when it got moved, so that you can you can run metrics of it. That, that will yes. be the one key thing. Yeah. Uh, um, Whiteboarding tools or physical walls give you that versatility to say, I can design something that fits my context rather than yeah. the tool that de determine it. But yeah. most, most companies are using a tool. I, I mean, I find that if you start with the tool, you immediately mm -hmm. constrain yourself. You've immediately stopped yourself from really designing what your workflow actually is. You, you're having to, here's the tool I have to use. 
and therefore I will force fit my workflow into this. And yes. nine times out of 10, it's going to be a few columns um, and that's it. And yeah. that's just not how people work. It's just not how teams work and it's not how value flows from team to team to team. Um, you need something that gives you that flexibility. I mean, if it wasn't for the I metrics, I would just use Mural, you know, but the metrics yeah. is really powerful for Active Managing Whip. So you need that. And that's where the tooling actually comes in. Um, I would rather have yeah. a whiteboard, same as Jose. I would rather have a whiteboard with cell tape and post-its. And that's what we would use um, to manage Kanban. Yeah. Even Mural and Mural these days allow you to do things like capture the start time and end time, and you can potentially do funky things with that. Mm -hmm. um, just, just, I love when you say the, the, the tool forces you uh, um, to use a Star Trek, like some many of these tools are like the Borg, you have to comply. <laughs> it's all this comply <laughs> mode. So um, I had to make a Star Trek joke, otherwise, you know, you know let, let me do it. Oh, yes, I can do it. Um, we had a question uh, from um, Atayero about, um, it's a very, very small question, when is Kanban not suitable? Um, I, I, I'm not convinced I've ever seen a situation in, in knowledge work um, where it's not been suitable. And I could even, you know, I'm speaking to a few other um, Scrum trainers and Kanban trainers recently, and, I could quite easily describe Scrum using Kanban um, terms. I could quite easily describe the Scrum framework by using Kanban. So, you know, Kanban is suitable in, in most places where you've got some kind of knowledge work and you're looking at um, cues of work flowing, value flowing. I've not seen somewhere where it wouldn't work, wouldn't, wouldn't fit yet. Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the, it's, it's, if there is some sort of kind of like, you can define a workflow, you can define yeah. the type of, and there is an element of consistency you can potentially use kanban yeah. um if you are in a system that there is a lot of volatility and you really really need to do a lot of what we call backward flow you may start thinking what's how do you handle this but even yeah. that might be possible yeah but it's only i mean if you end up with like to do doing done um anything beyond the personal kanban for that then it's like okay you yeah may as well not you you're as well not doing Kanban anymore because that's not workflow. That's just to do. Yeah, that. that's just, yeah, that's right. And yeah. you could use things like Knefin or Ralph Stacey to kind of describe your, your domain that you're working in. And if you happen to be in simple, then potentially you're better off just using a waterfall approach and just go for it and it's fine. Um, mm -hmm. That'd be yeah, sort of probably not well. suitable. And anything in chaos, nothing works in chaos. Um, bring, it, bring it to complexity or um, mm -hmm. complicated, but don't leave it in chaos. Yeah, so probably like not not chaotic, not super complex, and maybe not simple. Yeah, cool. Which is a lot of space. <laughs> so, it's a lot of space. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But knowledge work typically is on that complicated, complex middle grounds as well. So cool. Um, great question that one. Uh, Cyprian, would you like to follow up with? You had another question about the um, leading leading and lagging indicators. Yeah, so the more I get into, you know, explaining things to, to people, the more I get to <laughs> caught into some semantics, you know. It's kind of like with leading and lagging. So the first question would be, is there a way to just simply explain it to the team? You know, I, I kind of like just to, I don't know, a very simple example or a trick that you have to, to make people understand. Because I, I saw, you know, people who are, in my opinion, smart people who kind of struggle with that, you know, with the, with the concept, or maybe, you know, who, the one who explains is not that good at explaining that. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one thing. And the other thing it's about, uh, I saw that thing written, you know, like a, an indicator being a leading indicator of something, you know, like work item age, it's a leading indicator of cycle time, you know. Yes. It's kind of like, can you see that as a function? You know, it's kind of like, yeah, like, a, Function whip equal yeah, cycle time. <laughs> well, um, let's talk about. Do you have an answer for that? Um, all, I, all I was going to say was um, leading and lagging for me. So lagging indicator, the data is in the past. It's happened. You can't change it anymore. It's telling you something, but the data is past. And what I delivered in the past tense, what has already happened, leading um, is not happened yet, um, and I can do something about it. You can still change the outcome somehow. So that's why with work item age, 
is a leading indicator because I can see where it is right now in my workflow and I can do something about it today to get it done um, better, quicker. And that's why it's leading. So that's a simple um, answer for me. If, if I add to that, I mean, the, the thing about cycle time and throughput is that in order to know the cycle time of an item, we must it must have started and finished. Yeah. Because that's, it's the time between those two points. So at that point to realize that that, a, that item was too old, too, too long or whatever, it's too late for the item, it's finished. So that's why it's aligning. Throughput is the same. Throughput is measured at the point of delivery. So it's how many items have we delivered in past, again, looking at the past, um, for a unit of time. If, you know, that, that changing what has been done, not possible anymore. Um, age is a leading indicator because the, the, it's a work that is still in progress. So we can do actively manage flow to make sure that it's delivered within our service service level expectation, our SLE. It, we can still do things to make sure that it flows correctly or according, you know, at the right pace. So it's giving us early signals that we can still take action against. Yeah. Where I I am sometimes like difficult, it's like whip. Is it whip a leading or a lagging? I usually we say that whip is lagging. Because by the time that you realize the whip, the pull has already happened. The pull event has already happened. So you might then realize that, oops, we pull too much or we are over whip and we can do something about it. But it's, it's a little bit of a, it's, it's, it's kind of like borderline, but it's, it's lagging because that pull event has already happened. Yeah. What might still allow you, because it's still in progress, it's not finished, you might start thinking, okay, how are we going to make sure that we don't, we keep not breaking that whip or do something about that whip. Yeah. So it's kind of like for me, whip is it's kind of like it's lagging, but you can you can still use it in a leading way. You can still do something about it. The work is not finished. But yeah, for, for that whip event is already too late. Does that make sense? So yeah. it's it's just whether like we can still do something about it and influence something. Yeah. Tell me. And that may not make any sense, but that's how I rationalize it <laughs> okay um we're about time maybe we can do oh, can we do one final question from from testing yeah yeah uh, just one final question and it was like what, what ceremonies do you do you or your team like to use on a daily weekly basis um depends on the team there we go <laughs> <laughs> um See you later. yeah <laughs> <laughs> it kind of it kind of goes back to that um, question around the cycle times and throughput, where you've got a team where your your throughput is kind of in the two year cycle times like two years long. Then you're not going to meet daily. Um, you'll meet once a week or once say for two weeks or something. Like that. The team will figure out what the right the right cadence is for them to meet. Um, and it lines up to things that the business cadence you've got in the company and so on. Um, some teams um, like the team I'm working in, we'll meet every day. Um, and talk about what's happening and, and be as transparent as we can and use all that stuff. Um, so it really depends on the team, um, absolutely. But daily tends to, what I've found is that meeting daily eliminates a lot of different conversations and other meetings that you might otherwise have had because you're so transparent with each other. You don't actually need to have the extra meeting or the extra review meeting or whatever it is. You've had that daily conversation. Um, and so why bother having another meeting? Everyone knows what everyone's doing. So that's that's probably the the best answer to that. Um, the only thing I would, I would say is I tend to avoid using the word ceremony. I think it's probably the PST that's in me. But mm -hmm. <laughs> I tend to avoid ceremony because it feels so formal. The word ceremony just feels so formal that I'm, I need, do I need to bring a gift? Do I need to dress up nice? You know, do I need to uh, take a guest with me and so on? So I do, I do tend to avoid the word ceremony, um, but yeah. Daily, daily works really well. Let, let's call it ritual, <laughs> just to make it even better. Um, it's uh, I'm gonna borrow from the um, I'm gonna borrow from the flight levels um, thinking. And um, when we talk, we talk about agile interactions, um, which was I think in the question using exactly that. Um, 
uh, no ceremonies. Uh, so the the what we talk about is like what helps helps you decide as a team or as a group of people. You know um, how well are we doing? How things are progressing? When should when should what should be done and where and when? Um, how are we going to be doing these things? How well are we progressing? Those are the kind of questions that we need to keep asking ourselves regularly. Scrum, for example, has a, 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 a set of very, very defined answers. You know, you answer those questions through um, a daily Scrum, a sprint planning, um, sprint review, and a sprint retrospective. But if you think about those those four events, they are designed to answer those questions. How well are we progressing? How much can we do? When are we going to do it? Who's going to do it? How are we going to do it? How well, how well are things going? What can we do better? Yeah. So, um, what I like many times in the in in Kanban is that we tend to we have avoided trying to formalize what those events are, and we say your know, your context. Make sure that you design these kind of interactions in such a way that helps your context, your team, you know, your 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 reality. Cool. And and there is no there is no ritualistic answer that says you must you must do this meeting every every yeah. week because it's a, because someone says so. Yeah, what, whatever makes sense what, for the team. Yeah. Environment. Yeah. I don't do what I've seen sometimes like people like oh because you know because we had that daily stand ups are good and I'm going to use the word stand up. They have got like a C level C suite standing every every day fifteen minutes around the, the board table. It's like it doesn't make any sense. These people are talking about strategies that move every three years. Daily meetings like this don't make any sense. Yeah. Good stuff. On that note, we have run our time box. So thank you very much for fabulous questions, everyone. I mean, that has been really, I mean, time time has flown. Um, so thanks for all the questions and all the contributions. Dave, it's been a real honor. Thank we'll you. hope to have you again soon. Um Dave is a great, it's a, it's, it's a, I've done training with Dave. It's absolutely brilliant to train with him. Um, unfortunately, in order to be able to attend his classes, you have to be an employee of his company. So that may be a little bit more difficult, <laughs> we think. <laughs> but um, there is just thank you for sharing all your all your incredible knowledge and experience. It's, it's, a, it's an, a real honor. Um, the recording will be hopefully published uh, tonight. We'll try to download it tonight and upload it to YouTube, um, to the to, to the um, to the normal playlist. Um, we'll we'll try to share it on the on the Meta group. I'll put the links to the Meta group. Is Meta group you've searched for Pro Kanban, um or Pro Kanban community? You will find it, and you can also find it through the Pro Kanban, um, dot org website. So. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to take a break for the for the summer, and hopefully the next um, Ask the Common Trainer session will be starting back in September. And until then, I wish you all great health, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you soon. Thank cool. you. See you soon. Bye. Thanks, Jose. Thanks, guys. Thank you.